One question I get asked quite a lot about this transistor processor kit is what is the maximum speed it will run at and what's the limitation? So I thought I'd give a quick demonstration as to uh, the maximum speed this can be run at and then I'll follow it up with an explanation as to what causes that limitation and if you do want to experiment how to speed the machine up. Now I've got it configured here to run using an external clock. It's currently set to run at uh, 1 Hz. Uh, so you can see it's uh, ticking away quite slowly. So I'll gradually speed it up and it does become fairly evident when uh, it crashes and can no longer keep up with the, the clock. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll go over exactly why that is in a few minutes. So I'll increase the speed to 5 Hz and you'll see it's um, speed up. to 50. I'll get up to 1 kilohertz. Now from this point on most of the LEDs will appear to be on continuously. You might get some weird flickering on the camera due to the shutter speed but um, uh, after a certain point everything will just appear to be on all the time. Uh, but it will be fairly evident when the machine crashes. If you are experimenting like this, the best thing to do is put a scope onto the uh, data bus and you'll see the processor um, stop working at a certain point when you're going too fast. So I'll increase it um, up to 5 kilohertz. Still looking fine. Get up to 10. Still fine. 50 kilohertz. 100, so it is still running, 150, and you can see there it's stopped working. So I'll and change the duty cycle of the signal so it matches the clock generator on the actual board itself. The reason it uses a different duty cycle other than 50% is because of the way the circuits work and uh, you'll see how that comes into effect when I explain the individual circuits and their limitations. But it's uh, it's running again, I'll keep increasing the speed. So 150 kilohertz, 160, 170, we're getting close now to the limit, 180 and 190 and you can see it's crashed. If I go back down again it starts up again. So 180 it, it's fine, 190 it stops working. You can see it's very consistent in the way that it, it behaves to excess clock speed. It will just stop working. Uh, and that is because of the way that the excess clock speed causes it to stop working. And essentially what's happening is the um, propagation delay in some of the gates is such that the clock is running faster than the propagation delay. So in other words, the falling and rising edges of the clock are occurring at a rate that's faster than the propagation delay of some of the gates. And that means the gates won't switch properly. And as you know with a microprocessor, um, if you get an error in any of the signals, then the whole thing just stops working, it will crash. So I'll come back down to uh, a speed where we can see it operating again. So I'll back down to one kilohertz, and you can see it's fine. One of the things that I did when I designed this kit was to make sure that it was fairly robust and you're not going to do any harm by uh, overclocking it. It's very forgiving. It also means that you can experiment with it without fear of doing too much damage. Uh, just make sure the clock signal that you're feeding is correct. If you want to get the maximum speed of the external clock signal and feed it in at about 20% duty cycle. and that means you'll get the maximum possible speed. So what we'll look at now is the actual circuits and I will explain briefly why there is this limit on the maximum speed of the processor. And so what I'm going to do in this video is just show the effect on various values of components and explain why I selected the values that I did. Um, now firstly the processor is intended as a, a learning tool and something to experiment with. So the idea was that it would mostly be single stepped 
or run at the slow clock speed, which is just 8 hertz. So uh, I didn't really try to optimize it for speed. But in the book, I do go into quite some detail on how to optimize the circuits for speed and how to make them run much faster. Now, as I said, the limiting factor for the processor in the kit using the component value supplied is about 150 kilohertz, which is easily fast enough for its purpose. But if you do want to experiment with speeding up the processor, there are various ways that you can do that. Now, what I'm going to do is demonstrate the effects on various component values. So this is the circuit that we have on the breadboard. So this is the basic two input NAND gate configuration. The way we're using it here is B is being used just to turn the gate on and off. And I have a signal generator connected to this input. The 1K resistor is there to simulate the source impedance of previous circuits that would be feeding this NAND gate. So the reason 1K is selected is because if you imagine this output is feeding another NAND gate, then obviously the source impedance when it's pulling up is going to be 1K. When it's pulling down, it's obviously far less than that, but that means the worst case is 1K. And so you can assume that the source impedance is going to be around 1K worst case. And so that's what I have in this setup. So I'm currently feeding in a, a 1 kilohertz square wave with a 50% duty cycle. You can see the output currently is high because the second gate is tied to ground. So if I enable the gate, now firstly you can see that if you leave it floating, you get quite a, a good signal on the output. So channel 2 is connected to the output of the NAND gate. But the way these are normally used is it will be either high or low. So if we put it high, then that is what you would normally have in the circuit when the gate is enabled. Uh, the two inputs do interact, and that's one of the important points when designing a circuit like this. They are independent in terms of the logic signals, but in terms of the, the way the gate works internally, they, they do have an interaction. So although the square wave on the scope looks to be good in terms of the output matching the input, if we zoom in, it's also triggering on an edge here, if we zoom in, the top trace is the input, the bottom trace is the output, and as we get closer and closer, we zoom in. So now we're 100 nanoseconds per division, you'll see that when the input rises, the output drops off fairly quickly. And there's, there's quite a, a short delay. So that's obviously quite good. It means you get a, quite a high frequency. So as you can see, there's quite a significant delay between the falling edge of the input clock and the rising edge of the output. So that is between here, we have a, a falling edge, and then rising edge here, there's a significant delay between the two. And it's not caused by the value of this resistor. You might think that, oh, we'll just put a smaller value resistor in there and that will solve the problem. But that's not, that's not what's causing the, the issue. As you can see, from the falling edge of the input, there's a significant delay before the output even starts to rise. So it's not just a case of the resistors uh, not pulling output up fast enough. And that's actually caused by the uh, base capacitance of this transistor. So when this turns off, the circuit has to wait quite a long time for the charge that's on the base of this transistor to bleed away before the transistor can start to turn off. And it's at that point that the resistor takes over and, and pulls up. Until that charge bleeds away, this transistor is effectively still turned on. Uh, and this is a problem you get with bipolar transistors when you drive them into saturation, which is how this circuit works. Um, now, obviously, the problem this introduces is we have about, say, half microsecond kind of dead band in here that we can't really do anything about with this circuit in its current configuration. If we go back to...
two milliseconds per division, then it's not causing us a problem. So this is a one kilohertz clock. But if I change this to, let's go up to 150 kilohertz, which is the maximum frequency that the processor will run at in the kit form, you'll start to see why that is the case. So we've got exactly the same situation here that we had before. Nothing's changed, the edges are still the same. The real difference is that you can see that the rising edge of the clock is starting to get towards this delay and when the two overlap the output will stop switching altogether. So if I increase the input clock by 10 kilohertz at a time you'll see that what's happening is this stays the same because as I said this is caused by the transistor characteristic you'll see that this edge starts to get closer and closer to the rising edge. So we're currently on 160 kilohertz if I keep going you'll see that at some point the output stops switching altogether and that has a, a natural tendency to limit the frequency over which the circuit will work. As I said it's, it's not caused by the pull-up resistor value and it's not caused by the input impedance on this uh, resistor. It's, it's simply the case of the, the base capacitance of the output transistor. So what we can do to get around this is put something in to assist in speeding up the switch off of that transistor. So if we put a, a resistor to ground then what you can see now is without any other changes the output is looking very much healthier and we can keep now increasing the frequency of the output so if I go to 500 kilohertz you'll see that we're still in fairly good shape if I go to a megahertz it's still working so in other words it would be fairly simple to change this uh, resistor value such that the, the overall circuit and hence the overall microprocessor would run easily in excess of 1 megahertz. Um, the reason I haven't done that in the kit is firstly it would add another thousand resistors to the kit That's, obviously you have to solder in by hand and as I said the kit wasn't really intended as a, you know, a speed machine it was intended as a learning tool but also the value resistor here that will work is fairly um, critical, there's a fairly small range uh, over which the circuit will operate in terms of the value of this resistor. If it's um, too high it makes no difference. If you go slightly too low then the circuit will stop switching altogether. So we can go to a slightly smaller value resistor. It's exactly the same place in the circuit. And you can see now that we've kind of killed the thing, it's not working at all. Uh, so it is important that these circuits are designed in such a way that they will work in the way that they're intended with the limitations of build quality, non-resistor values, transistor variations, etc. So I'll, speed, I'll go back down to the speed that the system's intended to operate over and you can see that it works fine again. So if you do want to experiment with uh, increasing the performance of the processor, this is one way you can go about it. As I say, the limitation is purely down to the, um, the practicality of building something like this by hand. You could take the extra resistors in place if you wanted to. The processor will then run up around sort of one and a half megahertz, which is obviously quite good. Um, but you wouldn't really see it doing anything, it just like every, all the LEDs are on at the same time. So um, it, it would cease to be as useful as a learning tool. Also you might find that you have to select the resistor value for each circuit. The, the characteristics will be different for each of the different types of circuits and, and where they are in the processor. Uh, and again the idea was that uh, I'd select a single value of resistor rather than having the builder uh, need to put different values in different circuits so the ones chosen in the kit 
are the cover all values, they work in all the different circuits and all the different implementations. The trade off is the maximum speed of the processor, which, as I say, is around 150 kilohertz. So, hopefully, that all made sense. The limitation is down to practicality in the build, and that's uh, the, uh, the sole reason for selecting the values that I did.